During this webinar, I will suggest that motivational enhancement therapy or the mnemonic devices associated with motivational interviewing, things like ORs and frames that help organize MI's technique, will be necessary but are not necessarily sufficient to ensure engaging someone in change talk. But first, a bit about the presenter. As you can see, I was excited about learning of motivational enhancement counseling's potential from an early age. Although I am not a MINT certified trainer, MINT meaning motivational interviewing network of trainers, I have employed the principles of motivational interviewing and other motivational enhancement practices for 25 plus years and worked with individuals with substance use disorders for 45 plus years. In that time, I've developed a personal philosophy of counseling that is couched in the belief that to be involved in counseling is to affect the thinking of another so as to increase the likelihood of their moving towards growth and positive development. That is to say, to promote change through self-discovery. This photo with my second oldest grandson captures for me the essence of this philosophy and the spirit of interviewing for motivational enhancement. That is, infusing one's interactions with others with not only the practices and principles of motivational enhancement counseling, but most importantly, its essence which can be summed up in this quote from the Dalai Lama, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. This afternoon, we will consider how the underlying spirit of motivational enhancement counseling can engage interviewees in the exploration of their lives, initiate a shift in perspective, and foster a belief in what I call possibility thinking. It's when counseling technique is couched in an approach to interviewing that embraces the spirit of motivational enhancement that the attitudes of those being interviewed change. If the most renowned specialist in a particular area of medicine to whom you were referred comes across when you meet as arrogant, pompous, and overly self-important, the likelihood you will seek another referral is quite high. As a, client once, as a client once sent to me when referring to a previously unhelpful counseling experience, no matter how good a pair of shoes looks online, if they don't fit, you ain't going to wear them. It is possible to do everything according to the motivational enhancement playbook and yet still find interviewees responding as if to say, I dare you to make a difference in my life or engage in your interview as if it were a tug of war. You'll sometimes hear at AA meetings that people do not care what you know until they know that you care. This is the spirit that undergirds motivational enhancement counseling and is the very currency that funds the development of a meaningful helping relationship. In short, the spirit of motivational enhancement counseling is rooted in collaboration accomplishing together what the individual you interview has struggled with alone. The spirit that flows through motivational enhancement ensures related to this, motivating change talk is not concerned with inputting needed information. This is the antiquated approach to doing addictions counseling. Likewise, neither is it filling up the individual with what she or he lacks or needs to know or understand or accept in order to change. Rather, the practitioner is interested in drawing out what already exists within the individual and is therefore sufficient to affect the changes required to ensure self-discovery and growth. Calling upon an old Counseling 101 reference cited in this slide, the practitioner embracing the spirit of enhancing change talk seeks to help individuals discover and then understand those things hidden in the blind spot or the unknown by the individual but known by everyone else.
quadrants in this famous counseling diagram. Employing a backdoor approach creates an environment where change talk becomes possible. Traditional approaches to substance use disorder counseling have sought to help, or should I say, get individuals to see what's what. Often called interventions, such interactions come across as confrontations, whether such was the intent of the practitioner or not. This frequently is the result of not listening because of being distracted by obvious indications of a substance use disorder. Acknowledging that for one client, this, his, or her substance use may be perceived as a solution to a very real problem, and recognizing this is important. Acknowledging this is the first step to introducing ambivalence about change into a conversation. Remember, change is an inside job. As Sandra Annis Barnes writes in her book of poetry, life is the way it is. It's so hard when I have to, and easy when I want to. Adapting this phrase from her poem to our work as practitioners, it's hard when I have to change, and easy when I want to. Facilitating change talk is about helping individuals discover that they want to change, not that they need to change. Like in the adage about leading horses to water but not being able to make them drink, we need to remember that we can always salt the oats. In keeping with this, practitioners embracing the spirit of motivational enhancement conduct interviews that have more in common with an intercession than with an intervention. To intervene is a reactive verb and therefore consistent with not to mention proliferates, aggressive confrontation as the means of interacting with substance use disordered individuals. To intercede, on the other hand, is more consistent with what contemporary practitioners do when employing brief motivational techniques and is therefore more of a proactive verb, one associated with mediating on one's behalf. An intercession, excuse me, an intervention is when I confront you to stop or attempt to stop you from doing what I believe is wrong and this for you or to do what I am motivated by a genuine concern, if not love. So in other words, it's something that is done for the right reason, but necessarily comes across as being more confrontational in nature. An intercession, on the other hand, is when an interview is conducted in such a way as to allow those being interviewed to discover a new and different perspective from which to look at the facts they have believed are irrefutable and therefore intractable. This is a good point for us to pause in our presentation and to entertain some questions that you might have. Motivational enhancement is all about facilitating change talk. Most changers, especially those in a pre-contemplative stage of readiness to change, engage almost exclusively in what Miller calls sustain talk. The objective of the helping professional is to present those being interviewed with the opportunity to become ambivalent about change. Referencing Prochaska's continuum of readiness to change, this means to assess at what stage of readiness an individual is regarding making a change and to work towards helping her or him to progress to the next stage on that readiness continuum. Faithful adherence to the spirit of motivational enhancement counseling facilitates this progression and inviting individuals to share their stories rather than to tell us about their business, is an important example of this. In short, it is more productive to ask individual what's happening, rather than why it's happening. The objective is a collaboration between experts. 
You as the practitioner are the expert about treatment and the individual being interviewed as regards her or himself. Like the witness who sits with a sketch artist to develop an, an accurate picture of the suspect, helping professionals collaborate with their clients to develop an accurate picture of the presenting issue becomes the objective of an intercession. By eliciting stories rather than pursuing facts, practitioners permit two important opportunities to emerge in an interview. First, to engage the interviewee in a dialogue about her behavior rather than fielding questions about why that behavior occurred. To conduct an interview rather than an interrogation. And second, to demonstrate that you understand that for you and for your interviewee, there are rewards or what substance users view as good things associated with the behavior in question. Note, it's important to ask about the less good things related to use rather than the problems. Problems is one of those overly charged words that can all but end an interview as it suggests the practitioner is in league with all the others who have been confronting the interviewee about her or his problem. By distinguishing between what the interviewee views as the good and less good things related to use, practitioners then have the opportunity to align these consequences of use with amounts consumed. Frequently, the good things are associated with moderate use and the less good things with heavier or high risk and dangerous use. Remember, even when abstinence is the likely best course of action for someone with a substance use disorder, this good things, less good things approach facilitates the introduction of ambivalence, which is, of course, a precursor of change talk. A second objective when facilitating change talk is to shift the focus from the problem to your interviewees revisiting the facts in her or his life and answering a simple question. Is what I get from this behavior worth the cost or hassle involved in getting it? This is what economists call a cost-benefit analysis. And although nothing new as a management strategy, it is a somewhat novel approach in counseling, certainly different from what Miller refers to as attack therapy, which was a historic approach to substance use disorder counseling. Note how this is consistent with another key element of the spirit of motivational enhancement, in that it acknowledges the client is in control and will decide what she or he will do. In essence, it is about autonomy. A cost-benefit analysis of use is likely to facilitate ambivalence as it increases awareness by employing a type of reasoning the interviewee already uses in other areas of her or his life when making decisions regarding purchases or how best to invest their personal time. So how does a substance use disorder practitioner facilitate a discussion about the proverbial elephant in the room, that is to say, the individual's high risk and dangerous behavior? Well, things are not always the way they appear to be. This is where the techniques and motivational enhancement counseling can be most helpful in introducing and then amplifying ambivalence. It's all about facilitating a change in perspective. For example, is two minutes a long time or a short time? There are three possible answers to the question, short, long, and it depends. Although it depends is the correct answer, frequently interviewees will say it is a short time, to which you can then ask them, with a smile on your face I might add, hold your breath for two minutes. This simple instruction instantly creates a change in perspective. The spirit of motivational enhancement is furthered by using such examples to facilitate shifts in how clients view the facts in their lives and the smile on your face when suggesting that they hold their breath for two minutes lends a friendly if not playful air to the interview. 
For example, when an alcohol-dependent individual were to come in and you're doing a history with that individual, and as I oftentimes found myself doing with students in a um, college counseling center, when they were mandated to me uh, for a violation of the alcohol uh, policy of the university, and in that history, I would ask, you know, uh, about their usual drinking pattern. Frequently, I would hear students say things like, um, well, over a Thursday and Friday night, I might go out to a party and be there for three hours and have eight cups of beer. Now, eight cups of beer does not seem like much to that student because it was their usual amount, their normal amount, their average amount, and therefore a low-risk amount. But the red cups that they were drinking from, those solo cups many of you are familiar with, um, if you ever turn them upside down, you'll notice a little 16 over 18 on the bottom, which indicates that if filled to the brim, they'll hold at least 16, if not 18, ounces of fluid. So I would say to the student, which seems like more to you, eight cups of beer or eight pints of beer? Um, almost always the students would say pints. And I would follow this up by saying, okay, which sounds like more to you, eight pints or four quarts? Again, students usually would say four quarts. And I would follow this with the question, and which seems like more, four quarts or a gallon? And I would intentionally emphasize the word gallon, to which students almost always would say a gallon. And I would then scratch my head and in my best impersonation of Columbo would say, I'm a little bit confused. Help me understand here. You just got done telling me that uh, you, would, uh, you, you would drink a gallon of beer every Thursday and Friday night when you would go out to a party. Do you ever drink a gallon of iced tea or milk or water or anything in three hours? And they would say, no, I didn't say I drank a gallon of beer, to which I would say, you know, eight cups, eight pints, four quarts, a gallon. I would leave it at that. I wouldn't pursue it. I wouldn't use this as a proverbial hammer to hit them over the head with, uh, but rather as a way of kind of inviting them to look at their usual, their normal, their typical, their heretofore perceived as low risk amount of drinking from a different perspective. This can also be done with tobacco um, by asking individuals to sort of take a look at uh, the price that they pay for cigarettes and is the enjoyment they get on a daily basis worth what it costs them on a daily basis. And then asking them, is the enjoyment worth what they spend in a week? Is their enjoyment worth what they spend in a month? Is their enjoyment worth what they spend in a year? And for the pack-a-day cigarette smoker, paying $5 a pack for cigarettes, that comes out to over $1,800 in a year's time. And it provides that user with the opportunity to look at their use from a different perspective, one that is different from what they had perceived as being typical or normal or average or low-risk or non-problematic. And by seeing this from that different perspective, opening the door to an opportunity to begin to become ambivalent about their pattern of use. Again, unsolicited advice is the junk mail of counseling. So listening to interviewee stories elicits disclosure and, as a result, insight about use. Notice that we cannot speak as fast as we can think. So sharing our stories often slows down our thinking to a point where we can often notice the loopholes in our reasoning, which in turn heightens the likelihood of becoming ambivalent. As an aside, notice that LISTEN is an acronym for SILENT. L-I-S-T-E-N-S-I-L-E-N-T. Before proffering any advice or suggestions or recommendations, listen to client stories in silence before asking permission to perform um, or deliver any kind of suggestions. 
paraphrasing what Stephen Rolnick once said in a lecture about interviewing, if you act like you only have 15 minutes, it can take all day. But if you act like you have all day, it may only take 15 minutes. To get a sense of how unsolicited advice and recommendations uh, may be perceived by a substance use disordered individual, try this little exercise. Join your two hands by lacing your fingers together. Um, as you do this, notice which finger is on top of which, which thumb is on top of which thumb, right on top of left, right index finger on top of left index finger, and so on. Having noticed this, now unlace your fingers and relace them the other way so that the opposite fingers are now on top, the left on top of the right, the left index on top of the right, etc. How does it feel? Does it feel awkward, strange, odd? When I would do this with students in my counseling class, I would oftentimes ask them how it felt and then solicit from the class these particular um, adjectives describing how it felt. Rarely would they go for the word that I typically would want them to um, settle upon. So I would say something along the lines of, what I'm really fishing for here is the fact that it feels, the word starts with W and ends with R-O-N-G. It feels wrong. So when something feels wrong, the natural tendency is to write that wrong. So in the case of the interlaced fingers, the way that feels wrong, you want to unlace them and relace them the way that you're used to. Again, this is very similar to what any individual who is looking at changing their substance using behavior will experience. As they begin to challenge their traditional or their usual behavior, it's going to feel awkward, odd, strange, if you will, wrong. And the tendency to go back to the old way, and in the case of individuals who are looking to abstain from their use altogether, what's referred to as a slip or a relapse uh, may very well occur. So what we're talking about is being able to offer um, the opportunity to realize that to the extent that I was to tell you you must do this or you have to do this or to present you with all of the particular reasons why the way you're lacing your fingers is incorrect or doing harm to your body, you're still going to be feeling the fact that it's wrong and that tendency to, number one, go back to the old way, and number two, to argue with me as to why you should change this behavior at all. So this is another point where we can pause, and I'm happy to entertain the questions or comments that you may have. William Miller, when talking about interviewing, likens it to asking a very provocative question. Do you want to wrestle or do you want to dance? Remember that if ever entering into a tug of war with an interviewee, irrespective of how it turns out, you lose. So if we want to sort of take a look at a uh, contemporary uh, culture sort of um, example of this, it's sort of like saying, do you want your counseling session, your interview with the individual with whom you're, you're talking to be more like a WW Smackdown match or more like a Dancing with the Stars competition? In order to win in the wrestling match, someone has to lose. And to the extent that we're approaching the interview with a client as being a wrestling match, for me to win, you have to lose. And this sort of uh, um, argumentative relationship, this sort of confrontational relationship, is not going to facilitate the kind of change talk that we oftentimes are seeking when we're using motivational enhancement approaches. On the other hand, when you take a look at ballroom dancing, clearly someone is leading and someone is following. But until and unless that pair is in sync, 
there is not a chance for that particular um, um, competitive pair to be successful in their endeavor. So we're looking at, again, this spirit of collaboration, being able to recognize the fact that there are things that I can do as the practitioner and am expert at, and there are things that you can do and are expert at as the individual being interviewed. And when there is this collaboration between the two, that's when the change talk begins to surface. As likely as the spirit of motivational enhancement counseling is to facilitate change talk, arguing about anything with the client will facilitate sustained talk. <clears throat> when detecting a sense of ambivalence in an interviewee's comments, asking about the pros and the cons of making a change can facilitate a shift from sustained talk to change talk. Note, however, that your definition of change may differ from your clients. Remember, avoid arguments and recognize that half steps now are better than full steps in the future. And let me share with you a case in point. I was sitting in my office um, at LaSalle University a number of years ago uh, when the phone rang and it was the front desk um, announcing that a student that I had seen years previously uh, was asking if he could stop in to, to see me. And I said, of course. And this student came into the office um, and uh, we shook hands. And he says, uh, hey, doc, do you remember me? And this is one of those times when God lets you tell a lie and still get into heaven. I said, yeah, sure. How have you been? And he proceeded to tell me that after he graduated, that for a year, he had basically um, gone full throttle in his drinking. And after about a year's time, he, as he described it, crashed and burned, but was fortunate enough to have a father who was in recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous and took him to his first meeting. He reached into his pocket and he took out a brass medallion and he said, I just recently received my five-year chip for five years sober in AA. And he handed it to me to look at. And I took it and I looked at it and I looked up at him and I congratulated him. And as I handed it back, uh, he said, no, you don't understand, Doc. I want you to have this. And I said, I, I, I can't take this. This is too important. This is yours. He says, no, you don't understand. He said, you were the first person who ever shared your concern about my drinking, but didn't make me feel like a bad person when you did that. This, in essence, is, again, one of the fruits that is born as the result of using motivational enhancement uh, strategies and being true to the spirit of motivational enhancement therapy. This idea of being able to reach the individual and facilitate this opportunity to become ambivalent about their usual and typical behavior. And on an aha experience, the epiphany, if you will, uh, is the quintessential change in interviewee thinking that results in becoming active as regards moving towards change. People do not change because they need to. They change because they want to. And they want to change not to get away from what they don't want, but rather to get closer to what they do want. So the objective in the work that we're doing with our clients when interviewing them is attempting to help them shift their perspective so as to see another way of being able to accomplish objectives in their lives that don't necessitate the use of their substance of choice. As in The Wizard of Oz, when Toto pulls back the curtain to reveal that the great and powerful Oz is none other than Professor Chester Marvel from Kansas, so does the exuding the spirit of motivational enhancement counseling enable the practitioner to metaphorically pull back the curtain, so to speak, on Al K. Hall or Mary Joanna or Hare Owen or Park Osset and expose them 
for who they really are. Uh, you know, please excuse the, uh, the sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, metaphorical reference to these various substances, but this is uh, sort of a uh, version of what's referred to as an anchoring technique. Um, in Counseling 101, you'll oftentimes hear about anchoring techniques as being opportunities that practitioners will use when they're looking to make a point that they really want their client to recognize, to sort of stick in their client's mind. In the olden days when I was trained, um, I was trained that you would reach out and touch the client on the shoulder or the knee or make some kind of a gesture that would, um, uh, again, um, attract the attention of your client and sort of underscore the point that you were making. Um, in this day and age, that's probably not the best approach to take. Um, however, humor and almost silly sort of metaphors can actually accomplish the same thing. Because of their oddity, they serve as these anchors that can allow the point to be made. And I have found that being able to sort of refer to a, a client's uh, substance of, of choice, alcohol or marijuana or heroin, or uh, prescription medications, etc., uh, using some kind of a personification, um, and then referring to that as Al K. Hall, and seeing this as being a gremlin that's sitting on your shoulder, constantly whispering in your ear, um, actually sort of becomes a way of their being able to see, or at the very least conceptualize, uh, their dependence. So borrowing from cognitive behavior therapy, an intercession facilitates interviewees realizing that thoughts are not facts. When interceding, I neither stop you nor prevent you from deciding what you will or will not do, but I can create opportunities for you to consider the facts in your life from a different perspective oftentimes by employing some of the techniques for motivational interviewing, things such as oars and frames and other such uh, strategies and, uh, and ideas. Again, citing William Miller and Stephen Rolnick, uh, motivating change talk essentially boils down to exploring interviewee thoughts related to five basic questions. Now, these questions are not asked one right after the other in an interrogation style, and perhaps not even asked in order um, or um, may be asked over a series of interviews rather than any one single interview. They are, however, important in that they serve to create a trail of breadcrumbs that subtly leads an interviewee to a point where changing personal behavior becomes something an interviewee decides she or he wants and not just something everyone else demands. In essence, these questions are the metaphorical salt shaker that allows practitioners to salt the oats so that we no longer need to make the horse drink, if you will. By way of putting a bow on our webinar <clears throat> and to end, I welcome your comments. I welcome your questions at this particular point. Also, please keep in mind that you're most welcome to email any additional thoughts, reactions, questions, as I am happy to enter into a dialogue either via email, FaceTime, Zoom, or any other means. So with that, let's take some questions um, by way of conclusion. 